This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. China and the Chinese by Herbert Allen Giles Lecture 3 Democratic China Theoretically speaking, the empire of China is ruled by an autocratic monarch, responsible only to God, whose representative he is on earth. Once every year, the emperor prays at the Temple of Heaven, and sacrifices in solemn state upon its altar. He puts himself, as it were, into communication with the Supreme Being, and reports upon the fidelity with which he has carried out his imperial trust. If the emperor rules wisely and well, with only the happiness of his people at heart, there will be no sign from above, beyond peace and plenty in the empire, and now and then a double ear of corn in the fields, a phenomenon which will be duly recorded in the Peking Gazette. But should there be anything like laxness or incapacity, or still worse, degradation and vice, then a comet may perhaps appear, a pestilence may rage, or a famine, to warn the erring ruler to give up his evil ways. And just as the emperor is responsible to heaven, so are the viceroys and governors of the eighteen provinces, to speak only of China proper, nominally responsible to him, in reality to the six departments of state in Peking, which constitute the central government, and to which a seventh has recently been added a department for foreign affairs. So long as all goes well, and in ordinary times that all is confined to a regular and sufficient supply of revenue paid into the imperial treasury, viceroys and governors of provinces are, as nearly as can be, independent rulers, each in his own domain. For purposes of government, in the ordinary sense of the term, the eighteen provinces are subdivided into eighty areas known as circuits, and over each of these is set a high official, who is called an intendant of circuit, or in Chinese, a Dao Tai. His circuit consists of two or more prefectures, of which there are in all two hundred and eighty-two distributed among the eighty circuits, or about an average of three prefectures to each. Every prefecture is in turn subdivided into several magistracies, of which there are 1,477 in all, distributed among the 282 prefectures, or about an average of five magistracies to each. Immediately below the magistrates may be said to come the people, though naturally an official who rules over an area as big as an average English county can scarcely be brought into personal touch with all those under his jurisdiction. This difficulty is bridged over by the appointment of a number of head men, or head boroughs, who are furnished with wooden seals, and who are held responsible for the peace and good order of the wards or boroughs over which they are set. The post is considered an honourable one, involving as it does a quasi-official status, it is also more or less lucrative, as it is necessary that all petitions to the magistrate, all conveyances of land, and other legal instruments, should bear the seal of the head man as a guarantee of good faith, a small fee being payable on each notarial act. On the other hand, the post is occasionally burdensome and trying in the extreme. For instance, if a head man fails to produce any criminals or accused persons, either belonging to or known to be in his district, he is liable to be bambooed, or otherwise severely punished. In ordinary life the head man is not distinguishable from the masses of his fellow countrymen. He may often be seen working like the rest, and even walking about with bare legs and bare feet. Thus, in a descending scale, we have the emperor, the viceroys and governors of the eighteen provinces, the intendants, or Daotais, of the eighty circuits, the prefects of the two hundred and eighty prefectures, 
the magistrates of the 1,477 magistracies, the myriad headboroughs, and the people. The district magistrates, so far as officials are concerned, are the real rulers of China, and in conjunction with the prefects are popularly called father and mother officials, as though they stood in loco parentium to the people, whom, by the way, they in turn often speak of, even in official documents, as the babies. The ranks of these magistrates are replenished by drafts of those literati who have succeeded in taking the third or highest degree. Thus the first step on the ladder is open to all who can win their way by successful competition at certain literary examinations, so long as each candidate can show that none of his ancestors, for three generations, have been either actors, barbers and chiropodists, priests, executioners, or official servants. Want of means may be said to offer no obstacle in China to ambition and desire for advancement. The slightest aptitude in a boy for learning would be carefully noted, and if found to be the genuine article, would be still more carefully fostered. Not only are there plenty of free schools in China, but there are plenty of persons ready to help in so good a cause. Many a high official has risen from the furrowed fields, his educational expenses as a student, and his travelling expenses as a candidate, being paid by subscription in his native place. Once successful, he can easily find a professional money-lender, who will provide the comparatively large sums required for his outfit and journey to his post, whither this worthy actually accompanies him, to remain until he is repaid in full, with interest. A successful candidate, however, is not usually sent straight from the examination hall to occupy the important position of district magistrate. He is attached to some magistracy as an expectant official, and from time to time his capacity is tested by a case, more or less important, which is entrusted to his management as deputy. The duties of a district magistrate are so numerous and so varied that one man could not possibly cope with them all. At the same time, he is fully responsible. In addition to presiding over a court of first instance for all criminal trials in his district, he has to act as coroner, without a jury, at all inquests, collect and remit the land tax, register all conveyances of land and house property, act as preliminary examiner of candidates for literary degrees, and perform a host of miscellaneous offices, even to praying for rain or fine weather in cases of drought or inundation. He is up, if anything, before the lark, and at night, often late at night, he is listening to the protestations of prisoners or bambooing recalcitrant witnesses. But inasmuch as the district may often be a large one, and the two inquests may be going on in different locations on the same day, or there may be other conflicting claims upon his time, he has constantly to depute his duties to a subordinate, whose usual duties, if he has any, have to be taken by someone else, and so on. Thus it is that the expectant official every now and then gets his chance. This scheme leaves out of consideration a number of provincial officials who preside over departments which branch, as it were, from the main trunk, and of whom a few words only need now be said. There are several commissioners, as they are sometimes called. For instance, the Commissioner of Finance, otherwise known as the Provincial Treasurer, who is charged with the fiscal administration of his particular province, and who controls the nomination of nearly all the minor appointments in the civil service, subject to the approval of the governor. Then there is the Commissioner of Justice, or Provincial Judge, responsible for the due administration of justice in his province. There is also the Salt Commissioner, who collects the revenue derived from the government monopoly of the salt trade, and the grain commissioner who looks after the grain tax, and sees that the tribute rice is annually forwarded to Peking for the use of the imperial court. There are also military officials, 
belonging to two separate and distinct army organizations. The Manchus, when they conquered the empire, placed garrisons of their own troops under the command of Manchu generals at various important strategic points, and the Tartar generals, as they are called, still remain, ranking nominally just above the viceroy of the province, over whose actions they are supposed to keep a careful watch. Then there is a provincial army, with a provincial commander-in-chief, etc. Now let us return to the main trunk, working upward by way of recapitulation. We have reached the people and their head men, or head boroughs, over whom is set the magistrate, with a nominal salary, which would be quite insufficient for his needs, even if he were ever to draw it, for he has a large staff to keep up, some few of whom, no doubt, keep themselves by fees and douceur of various kinds, obtained from litigants and others who have business to transact. The income on which the magistrate lives, and from which, after a life of incessant toil, he saves a moderate competence for the requirements of his family, is deducted from the gross revenues of his magistracy, leaving a net amount to be forwarded to the imperial treasury. So long as his superiors are satisfied with what he remits, no questions are asked as to original totals. It is recognized that he must live, and the value of every magistracy is known within a few hundred ounces of silver one way or the other. Above the magistrate, and in control of several magistracies, comes the prefect, who has to satisfy his superiors in the same way. He has the general supervision of all civil business in his prefecture, and to him must be referred every appeal case from the magistracies under his jurisdiction, before it can be filed in a higher court. Above him comes the intendant of circuit, or Daotai, in control of several prefectures, to whom the same rule applies as to satisfying demands of superiors, and above him come the governor and viceroy, who must also satisfy the demands of the state departments in Peking. It would now appear, from what has already been stated, that all a viceroy or governor has to do is to exact sufficient revenue from immediate subordinates, and leave them to exact the amounts necessary from their subordinates, and so on down the scale, until we reach the people. The whole question, therefore, resolves itself into this. What can the people be made to pay? The answer to that question will be somewhat of a staggerer to those who, from a distance, or from want of close observation, regard the Chinese as a downtrodden people, on a level with the fellahin of Egypt in past times. For the answer, so far as my own experience goes, is that only so much can be got out of the Chinese people as the people themselves are ready and willing to pay. In other words, with all their show of an autocratic ruler and a paternal government, the people of China tax themselves. I am now about to do more than state this opinion. I am going to try to prove it. The philosopher Mencius who flourished about one hundred years after Confucius, and who is mainly responsible for the final triumph of the Confucian doctrine, was himself not so much a teacher of ethics as a teacher of political science. He spent a great part of his life wandering from feudal state to feudal state, advising the various vassal nobles how to order their dominions with the maximum of peace and prosperity and the minimum of misery and bloodshed. One of those nobles, Duke I, asked Mencius concerning the proper way to govern a state. The affairs of the people, replied the philosopher, must not be neglected, for the way of the people is thus. If they have a fixed livelihood, their hearts will also be fixed. But if they have not a fixed livelihood, neither will their hearts be fixed. And if they have not fixed hearts, there is nothing in the way of crime which they will not commit. Then, when they have involved themselves in guilt, to follow up and punish them, this is but to ensnare them. 
In another passage, Mencius says, The tyrants of the last two dynasties, Jie and Zhou, lost the empire because they lost the people, by which I mean that they lost the hearts of the people. There is a way to get the empire. Get the people, and you have the empire. There is a way to get the people. Get their hearts, and you have them. There is a way to get their hearts. Do for them what they wish, and avoid doing what they do not wish. Those are strong words, especially when we consider that they come from one of China's most sacred books, regarded by the Chinese with as much veneration as the Bible by us, a portion of that Confucian canon, the principles of which it is the object of every student to master, and should be the object of every Chinese official to carry into practice. But those words are mild compared with another utterance by Mencius in the same direction. The people are the most important element in a nation. The gods come next. The sovereign is the least important of all. We have here, in Chinese dress, wherein indeed much of Western wisdom will be found, if students would only look for it, very much the same sentiment as in the familiar lines by Oliver Goldsmith, Princes and lords may flourish or fade, a breath can make them, as a breath has made. But a bold peasantry, their country's pride, when once destroyed, can never be supplied. The question now arises, are all these solemn sayings of Mencius to be regarded as nothing more than mere literary rodomontade, wherewith to beguile an enslaved people? Do the mandarins keep the word of promise to the ear and break it to the hope? Or do the Chinese people enjoy in real life the recognition which should be accorded to them by the terms of the Confucian canon? Everyone who has lived in China and has kept his eyes open must have noticed what a large measure of personal freedom is enjoyed by even the meanest subject of the Son of Heaven. Any Chinaman may travel all over China without asking anyone's leave to start, and without having to report himself or be reported by his innkeeper at any place in which he may choose to stop. He requires no passport. He may set up any legitimate business at any place. He is not even obliged to be educated or to follow any particular calling. He is not obliged to serve as a soldier or sailor. There are no sumptuary laws, not even any municipal laws. Outside the penal code, which has been pronounced by competent Western lawyers to be a very ably constructed instrument of government, there is nothing at all in the way of law. Civil law being altogether absent as a state institution. Even the penal code is not too rigidly enforced. So long as a man keeps clear of secret societies and remains a decent and respectable member of his family and of his clan, he has very little to fear from the officials. The old ballad of the husbandman, which has come down to us from a very early date indeed, already hints at some such satisfactory state of things. It runs thus. Work, work, from the rising sun till sunset comes and the day is done. I plough the sod and harrow the clod, and meat and drink both come to me. Ah, what care I for the powers that be? Many petty offences, which are often dealt with very harshly in England, pass in China almost unnoticed. No shopkeeper or farmer would be fool enough to charge a hungry man with stealing food, for the simple reason that no magistrate would convict. It is the shopkeeper's or farmer's business to see that such petty thefts cannot occur. Various other points might be noticed, but we must get back to taxation, which is really the crux of the whole position. Altogether, the Chinese people may be said to be lightly taxed. There is the land tax, in money and in kind, a tax on salt, and various octroi and customs duties, all of which are more or less fixed quantities, so that the approximate amount which each province should contribute to the central government is well known at Peking. 
just as it is well known in each province what amounts, approximately speaking, should be handed up by the various grades of territorial officials. I have already stated that municipal government is unknown. Consequently, there are no municipal rates to be paid, no water rate, no poor rate, and not a cent for either sanitation or education. And so long as the imperial taxes are such as the people have grown accustomed to, they are paid cheerfully, even if sometimes with difficulty, and nothing is said. A curious instance of this conservative spirit in the Chinese people, even when operating against their own interests, may be found in the tax known as Li Kin, against which foreign governments have struggled so long in vain. This tax, originally one-tenth per cent on all sales, was voluntarily imposed upon themselves by the people, among whom it was at first very popular, with a view of making up the deficiency in the land tax of China caused by the Taiping Rebellion and subsequent troubles. It was to be set apart for military purposes only, hence its common name, war tax, and was alleged by the Zhongli Yamen to be adopted merely as a temporary measure. Yet though forty years have elapsed, it still continues to be collected as if it were one of the fundamental taxes of the empire, and the objections to it are raised not by the people of China, but by foreign merchants with whose trade it interferes. Here we have already one instance of voluntary self-taxation on the part of the people. What I have yet to show is that all taxation, even though not initiated as in this case by the people, must still receive the stamp of popular approval before being put into force. On this point, I took a good many notes during a fairly long residence in China, leading to conclusions which seemed to me irresistible. Let us suppose that the high authorities of a province have determined, for pressing reasons, to make certain changes in the incidence of taxation, or have called upon their subordinates to devise means of causing larger sums to find their way into the provincial treasury. The invariable usage, previous to the imposition of a new tax, or change in the old, is for the magistrate concerned to send for the leading merchants whose interests may be involved, or for the head boroughs and village elders according to the circumstances in each case, and to discuss the proposition in private. Over an informal entertainment, over tea and pipes, the magistrate pleads the necessities of the case and the peremptory orders of his superiors. The merchants, or village elders, feeling that, as in the case of Leakin, already mentioned, when taxes come they come to stay, resist on principle the new departure by every argument at their control. The negotiation ends, in ninety-nine instances out of a hundred, in a compromise. In the hundredth instance, the people may think it right to give way, or the Mandarin may give way, in which case things remain in statu quo, and nothing further is heard of the matter. There occur cases, however, happily rare, in which neither will give way, at first. Then comes the tug of war. A proclamation is issued describing the tax, or the change, or whatever it may be, and the people, if their interests are sufficiently involved, prepare to resist. Combination has been raised in China to the level of a fine art. Nowhere on earth can be found such perfect cohesion of units against forces which would crush each unit taken individually beyond recognition. Every trade, every calling, even the meanest, has its guild or association, the members of which are ever ready to protect one another with perfect unanimity and often great self-sacrifice. And combination is the weapon with which the people resist and successfully resist any attempt on the part of the governing classes to lay upon them loads greater than they can or will bear. The Chinese are withal an exceptionally law-abiding people, and entertain a deep-seated respect for authority, but their obedience, 
and their deference have pecuniary limits. I will now pass from the abstract to the concrete and draw upon my notebook for illustrations of this theory that the Chinese are a self-taxing and self-governing people. Under date October the 10th, 1880, from Chongqing in the province of Sichuan, the following story will be found in the North China Herald, told by a correspondent. Yesterday the Baxian magistrate issued a proclamation saying that he was going to raise a tax of 200 cash on each pig killed by the pork butchers in this city, and the butchers were to reimburse themselves by adding two cash per pound to the price of pork. The butchers, who had already refused to pay 100 cash per hog, under the late magistrate, were not likely to submit to the payment of 200 under this one, and so resolved not to kill pigs until the grievance was removed, and this morning a party of them went about the town and seized all the pork they saw exposed for sale. Then the whole of the butchers, over five hundred at least, shut themselves up in their guild, where the magistrate tried to force an entry with two hundred or three hundred of his runners. The butchers, however, refused to open the door, and the magistrate had to retire very much excited, threatening to bring them to terms. People are inclined to think the magistrate acted wrongly in taking a large force with him, saying he ought to have gone alone. Three days later, October the 13th. There is great excitement throughout the city, and I am told that the troops are under arms. I have heard several volleys of small arms being fired off, as if in platoon exercise. All the shops are shut, people being afraid that the authorities may deal severely with the butchers, and that bad characters will profit by the excitement to rob and plunder the shops. Two days later, October the 15th. The pork butchers are still holding out in their guildhouse and refuse to recommence business until the officials have promised that the tax on pigs will not be enforced now or hereafter. The prefect has been going the rounds of the city calling on the good people of his prefecture to open their doors and transact business as usual, saying that the tax on pigs did not concern other people but only the butchers. One day later, October the 16th, the Barsian magistrate has issued a proclamation apologizing to the people generally, and to the butchers particularly, for his share of the work in trying to increase the obnoxious tax on pigs. So the officials have all miserably failed in squeezing a cash out of the sovereign people of Sichuan. I have a similar story from Hangzhou in Zhejiang, under date April the 10th, 1889, which begins as follows. The great city of Hangzhou is extremely dry. There are probably 700,000 people here, but not a drop of tea can be bought in any of the public tea houses. There is a strike in tea. The tea houses are all closed by common agreement to resist a tax imposed in the beginning of the year to raise money for the sufferers of famine. In the next communication from this correspondent we read, the strike of the keepers of tea-shops ended very quietly a few days after it began, by the officials agreeing to accept the sum of fifteen hundred dollars once for all, and release tea from taxation. This is what happened recently in Pak Hoi, in the province of Guangdong. Without the consent of the dealers, a new local tax was imposed on the raw opium in preparation for use in the opium shops. The imposition of this tax brought to light the fact, hitherto kept secret, that of the opium consumed in Pak Hoi and its district, only 62% was imported drug, the remaining third being native opium, which was smuggled into Pak Hoi and avoided all taxation. The new tax brought this smuggled opium under contribution, and this was more than the local opium interest would stand. The opium dealers adopted the usual tactics of shutting their shops, thus transferring the onus of opposition to their customers. These last paid a threatening visit to the chief authority of Pak Hoi, and then wrecked the newly established tax office. This indication of popular feeling was enough for the local authorities at Lianzhou, the district city, 
and the tax was changed so as to fall on the foreign opium, the illicit native supply being discreetly ignored, and all rioters forgiven. So much for taxation. Let us take an instance of interference with prescriptive rights, in connection with the great incorruptible viceroy, Zhang Zhidong, to whom we are all so much indebted for his attitude during the siege of the legations in 1900. Ten years ago, when starting his ironworks at Wuchang, in the province of Hubei, he ordered the substitution of a drawbridge over a creek for the old bridge which had stood there from time immemorial, the object being to let steamers pass freely up and down. Unfortunately, the old bridge was destroyed before the new one was ready. What was the result? The people rushed to the yamen and insisted by deputation and mass brawling on the restoration of the bridge. Finally, the viceroy thought it worth his while to issue a rhyming proclamation, assuring the people that what he was doing was for their good, and justifying his several schemes. Yet Zhang Zhidong always has been, and is still, one of the strongest officials who ever sat upon a viceroy's throne. In November 1882, there was a very serious military riot in Hankou, on the opposite side of the Yangtze to Wuchang. It arose out of a report that four soldiers had been arrested and were to be secretly beheaded the same night. This rising might have assumed very serious dimensions, but for the prompt submission of the viceroy to the soldiers' demands. As it was, the whole city was thrown into a state of utmost alarm. Few of the inhabitants slept that night. The streets were filled with a terror-stricken population, expecting at any moment to hear that the prison doors had been forced and the criminals let loose to join the soldiers in their determination to kill the officials, plunder the treasury, and sack the city. Many citizens are said to have fled from the place, and the sudden rush upon the cash shops to convert paper notes into silver brought some of them to the verge of bankruptcy. I have recorded, under March 1891, a case in which several Manchus were sentenced by the magistrate of Jinjiang, at the instance of the local general, to a bambooing for rowdy behaviour. This is what followed. The friends of the prisoners, to the number of about three hundred, assembled at the city temple, vowing vengeance on the magistrate and general. They proceeded to the yamen of the general, wrecked the wall and part of the premises, and put the city in an uproar. The magistrate fled with his family to the Daotai's yamen, where two hundred regular troops were sent to protect him against the fury of the Manchus, who threatened his life. This is what happened to another magistrate in Jiangsu. He had imprisoned a tax collector for being in arrears with his money, and the tax collector's wife, frantic with rage, rushed to the magistracy and demanded his release. Unfortunately, she was suffering from severe asthma, and this, coupled with her anger, caused her death actually in the magistrate's court. The people then smashed and wrecked the magistracy, and pummeled and bruised the magistrate himself, who ultimately effected his escape in disguise and hid himself in a private dwelling. Everyone who has lived in China knows how dangerous are the periods when vast numbers of students congregate for the public examinations. Here is an example. At Canton, in June 1880, a student took back a coat he had purchased for half a dollar at a second-hand clothes shop and wished to have it changed. The shopkeeper gave him rather an impatient answer, and thereupon the student called in a band of his brother B.A.'s to claim justice for literature. They seized a reckoning board, or abacus, that lay on the counter, struck one of the assistants in the shop, and drew blood. The shopkeeper then beat an alarm on his gong, and summoned friends and neighbours to the rescue. Word was at once passed to bands of students in the neighbourhood, who promptly obeyed the call of a distressed comrade, and blows were delivered right and left. The shopkeepers summoned the district magistrate to the scene. Upon his arrival, 
he ordered several of the literary ringleaders, who had been seized and bound by the shopkeepers, to be carried off and impounded. In the course of the evening he sentenced them to be beaten. A body of more than a hundred students then went to his yamen and demanded the immediate release of the prisoners. The magistrate grew nervous, yielded to their threats, and sent several of the offending students home in sedan chairs. The magistrate then seized the assistants in the shop where the row began, and sentenced them to be beaten on the mouth. Next morning ten thousand shops were closed in the city and suburbs. The shopkeepers said they could not do business under such an administration of law. In the course of the morning, a large meeting of the students was held in a college adjoining the examination hall. The district magistrate went out to confer with them. The students cracked his gong and shattered his sedan chair with showers of stones, and then prodded him with their fans and umbrellas, and bespattered him with dirt, as his followers tried to carry him away on their shoulders. He was quite seriously hurt. The prefect then met a large deputation of the shopkeepers in their guildhouse in the course of the day, and expressed his dissatisfaction at the way in which the district magistrate had acted. A settlement was thus reached, which included fireworks for the students, and business was resumed. Any individual who is aggrieved by the action, or inaction, of a Chinese official may have immediate recourse to the following method for obtaining justice, witnessed by me twice during my residence in China, and known as crying one's wrongs. Dressed in the grey sackcloth garb of a mourner, the injured party, accompanied by as many friends as he or she can collect together, will proceed to the public residence of the offending Mandarin, and there howl, and be otherwise objectionable, day and night, until some relief is given. The populace is invariably on the side of the wronged person, and if the wrong is deep, or the delay in writing it too long, there is always great risk of an outbreak, with the usual scene of house-wrecking and general violence. It may now well be asked, how justice can ever be administered under such circumstances, which seem enough to paralyze authority in the presence of any evil-doer who can bring up his friends to the rescue. To begin with, there is in China, certainly at all great centers, a large criminal population without friends, men who have fallen from their high estate through inveterate gambling, indulgence in opium-smoking, or, more rarely, alcohol, no one raises a finger to protect these from the utmost vengeance of the law. Then again, the Chinese, just as they tax themselves, so do they administer justice to themselves. Trade disputes, petty and great alike, are never carried into court, there being no recognized civil law in China beyond custom. They are settled by the guilds or trades unions, as a rule to the satisfaction of all parties. Many criminal cases are equally settled out of court, and the offender is punished by agreement of the clan elders or heads of families, and nothing is said. For compounding a felony is not a crime, but a virtue in the eye of the Chinese, who look on all litigation with aversion and contempt. In the case of murder, however, and some forms of manslaughter, the ingrained conviction that a life should always be given for a life often outweighs any money value that could be offered, and the majesty of the law is upheld at any sacrifice. It is not uncommon for an accused person to challenge his accuser to a kind of trial by ordeal at the local temple. Kneeling before the altar, at midnight, in the presence of a crowd of witnesses, the accused man will solemnly burn a sheet of paper, on which he has written, or caused to be written, an oath, totally denying his guilt, and calling upon the gods to strike him dead upon the spot, or his accuser, if either one of them is deviating in the slightest degree from the actual truth. This is indeed a severe ordeal to a superstitious people, whatever it may seem to us. 
Even the mandarins avail themselves of similar devices in cases where they are unable to clear up a mystery in the ordinary way. In a well-known case of a murder by a gang of ruffians, the magistrate, being unable to fix the guilt of the fatal blow upon any one of the gang, told them that he was going to apply to the gods. He then caused them all to be dressed in black coats, as is usual with condemned criminals, and arranged them in a dark shed with their faces to the wall, saying that, in response to his prayers, a demon would be sent to mark the back of the guilty man. When at length the accused were brought out of the shed, one of them actually had a white mark on his back, and he at once confessed. In order to outwit the demon, he had slyly placed his back against the wall, which, by the magistrate's secret orders, had previously received a coat of whitewash. I will conclude with a case which came under my own personal observation, and which first set me definitely on the track of democratic government in China. In 1882 I was vice-consul at Pagoda Anchorage, a port near the famous Fuzhou Arsenal, which was bombarded by Admiral Corbett in 1884. My house and garden were on an eminence overlooking the arsenal, which was about half a mile distant. One morning, after breakfast, the head official servant came to tell me there was trouble at the arsenal. A military mandarin, employed there as superintendent of some department, had that morning early kicked his cook, a boy of seventeen, in the stomach, and the boy, a weakly lad, had died within an hour. The boy's widowed mother was sitting by the body in the mandarin's house, and a large crowd of workmen had formed a complete ring outside, quietly awaiting the arrival and decision of the authorities. By five o'clock in the afternoon, a deputy had arrived from the magistracy at Fuzhou, twelve miles distant, empowered to hold the usual inquest on behalf of the magistrate. The inquest was duly held, and the verdict was accidental homicide. In shorter time than it takes me to tell the story, the deputy's sedan chair and paraphernalia of office were smashed to atoms. He himself was seized, his official hat and robe were torn to shreds, and he was bundled unceremoniously, not altogether unbruised, through the back door and through the ring of onlookers, into the paddy fields beyond. Then the ring closed up again, and a low, threatening murmur broke out, which I could plainly hear from my garden. There was no violence, no attempt to lynch the man. The crowd merely waited for justice. That crowd remained there all night, encircling the murderer, the victim, and the mother. Bulletins were brought to me every hour, and no one went to bed. Meanwhile the news had reached the Viceroy, and by half-past nine next morning the smoke of a steam launch was seen away up the bends of the river. This time it bore the district magistrate himself, with instructions from the Viceroy to hold a new inquest. At about ten o'clock he landed and was received with respectful silence. By eleven o'clock the murderer's head was off, and the crowd had dispersed. End of Lecture 3《LibriVox Recording》All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. China and the Chinese by Herbert Allen Giles Lecture 4 China and Ancient Greece The study of Chinese presents at least one advantage over the study of the Greek and Roman classics. I might add of Hebrew, of Syriac, and even of Sanskrit. It may be pursued for two distinct objects. The first and most important object to many is to acquire a practical acquaintance with a living language, spoken and written by about one-third of the existing population of the earth, with a view to the extension of commercial enterprise, 
and to the profits and benefits which may legitimately accrue therefrom. The second is precisely that object in pursuit of which we apply ourselves so steadily to the literatures and civilizations of Greece and Rome. Sir Richard Jebb, in his essay on Humanism in Education, points out that even less than a hundred years ago the classics still held a virtual monopoly, so far as literary studies were concerned, in the public schools and universities of England. The culture which they supplied, he argues, while limited in the sphere of its operation, had long been an efficient and vital influence, not only in forming men of letters and learning, but in training men who afterwards gained distinction in public life and in various active careers. Long centuries had fixed so firmly in the minds of our forefathers a belief, and no doubt to some extent a justifiable belief, in the perfect character of the languages, the literatures, the arts, and some of the social and political institutions of ancient Greece and Rome, that a century or so ago there seemed to be nothing else worth the attention of an intellectual man. The comparatively recent introduction of Sanskrit was received in the classical world not merely with coldness, but with strenuous opposition and all the genius of its pioneer scholars was needed to secure the meed of recognition which it now enjoys as an important field of research. The Regius Professorship of Greek in the University of Cambridge, England, was founded in 1540, but it was not until 1867, more than three centuries later, that Sanskrit was admitted into the university curriculum. It is still impossible to gain a degree through the medium of Chinese, but signs are not wanting that the necessity for such a step will be more widely recognized in the near future. All the material lies ready to hand. There is a written language, which for difficulty is unrivaled, polished and perfected by centuries of the minutest scholarship, until it is impossible to conceive anything more subtly artistic as a vehicle of human thought. Those mental gymnastics of such importance in the training of youth, which were once claimed exclusively for the languages of Greece and Rome, may be performed equally well in the Chinese language. The educated classes in China would be recognized anywhere as men of trained minds, able to carry on sustained and complex arguments, without violating any of the Aristotelian canons, although as a matter of fact they never heard of Aristotle, and possess no such work in all their extensive literature as a treatise on logic. The affairs of their huge empire are carried on, and in my opinion very successfully carried on, with some reservations of course, by men who have had to get their mental gymnastics wholly and solely out of Chinese. I am not aware that their diplomatists suffer by comparison with ours, the Marquis Tsung and Li Hongzhang, for instance, representing opposite schools, were admitted masters of their craft, and made not a few of their own diplomatists look rather small beside them. Speaking further of the study of the Greek and Roman classics, Sir Richard Jebb says, There can be no better proof that such a discipline has penetrated the mind, and has been assimilated, than if, in the crises of life, a man recurs to the great thoughts and images of the literature in which he has been trained, and finds there what braces and fortifies him, a comfort, an inspiration, an utterance for his deeper feelings. Sir Richard Jebb then quotes a touching story of Lord Granville, who was President of the Council in 1762, and whose last hours were rapidly approaching. In reply to a suggestion that, considering his state of health, some important work should be postponed, he uttered the following impassioned words from the Iliad, spoken by Sarpedon to Glaucus. Ah, friend, if, once escaped from this battle, we were forever to be ageless and immortal, I would not myself fight in the foremost ranks, nor would I send thee into the war that giveth men renown. But now, since ten thousand fates of death beset us every day, and these no mortal may escape or avoid, now let us go forward. 
Such was the discipline of the Greek and Roman classics upon the mind of Lord Granville at a great crisis in his life. Let us now turn to the story of a Chinese statesman, nourished only upon what has been too hastily stigmatized as the dry bones of Chinese literature. Wen Tianxiang was born in A.D. 1236. At the age of twenty-one, he came out first on the list of successful candidates for the highest literary degree. Upon the draft list submitted to the emperor, he had been placed seventh, but his majesty, after looking over the essays, drew the grand examiner's attention to the originality and excellence of that of Wen Tianxiang, and the examiner, himself a great scholar and no sycophant, saw that the emperor was right and altered the places accordingly. Four or five years later, Wen Tianxiang attracted attention by demanding the execution of a statesman who had advised that the court should quit the capital and flee before the advance of the victorious Mongols. Then followed many years of hard fighting, in the course of which his raw levies were several times severely defeated, and he himself was once taken prisoner by the Mongol general Bayan, mentioned by Marco Polo. He managed to escape on that occasion, but in 1278 the plague broke out in his camp, and he was again defeated and taken prisoner. He was sent to Peking, and every effort was made to induce him to own allegiance to the Mongol conqueror, but without success. He was kept several years in prison. Here is a well-known poem which he wrote while in captivity. There is in the universe an aura an influence which permeates all things, and makes them what they are. Below, it shapes forth land and water, above, the sun and the stars. In man, it is called spirit, and there is nowhere where it is not. In times of national tranquillity, this spirit lies hidden in the harmony which prevails. Only at some great epoch is it manifested widely abroad. Here Wen Tianxiang recalls, and dwells lovingly upon, a number of historical examples of loyalty and devotion. He then proceeds, Such is this grand and glorious spirit which endureth for all generations, and which, linked with the sun and moon, knows neither beginning nor end. The foundation of all that is great and good in heaven and earth, it is itself born from the everlasting obligations which are due by man to man. Alas, the fates were against me. I was without resource. Bound with fetters, hurried away toward the north, death would have been sweet indeed, but that boon was refused. My dungeon is lighted by the will of the wisp alone. No breath of spring cheers the murky solitude in which I dwell. The ox and the barb herd together in one stall. The rooster and the phoenix feed together from one dish. Exposed to mist and dew, I had many times thought to die, and yet, through the seasons of two revolving years, disease hovered around me in vain. The dark, unhealthy soil to me became paradise itself, for there was that within me which misfortune could not steal away, and so I remained firm, gazing at the white clouds floating over my head, and bearing in my heart a sorrow boundless as the sky. The sun of those dead heroes has long since set, but their record is before me still, and while the wind whistles under the eaves, I open my books and read, and lo, in their presence my heart glows with a borrowed fire. At length, Wen Tianxiang was summoned into the presence of Kublai Khan, who said to him, What is it you want? By the grace of his late majesty of the Song dynasty, he replied, I became his majesty's minister. I cannot serve two masters. I only ask to die. Accordingly he was executed, meeting his death with composure, and making a final obeisance toward the south, as though his own sovereign was still reigning in his capital. May we not then plead that this Chinese statesman, equally with Lord Granville, at a crisis of his life, recurred to the great thoughts and images of the literature in which he had been trained, and found there what braced and fortified him, 
a comfort, an inspiration, an utterance for his deeper feelings. Chinese history teems with the names of men who, with no higher resource of inspiration than the Confucian canon, have yet shown that they can nobly live and bravely die. Han Yu of the 8th and 9th centuries was one of China's most brilliant statesmen and writers, and rose rapidly to the highest offices of state. When once in power, he began to attack abuses and was degraded and banished. Later on, when the court, led by a weak emperor, was going crazy over Buddhism, he presented a scathing memorial to the throne, from the effect of which it may well be said that Buddhism has not yet recovered. The emperor was furious, and Han Yu narrowly escaped with his life. He was banished to the extreme wilds of Guangdong, not far from the now flourishing treaty port of Swatow, where he did so much useful work in civilizing the aborigines that he was finally recalled. Those wilds have long since disappeared as such, but the memory of Han Yu remains, a treasure forever. In a temple which contains his portrait, and which is dedicated to him, a grateful posterity has put up a tablet bearing the following legend, Wherever he passed, he purified. The last emperor of the Ming dynasty, which was overthrown by rebels and then supplanted by the Manchus in 1644, was also a man who in the Elysian fields might well hold up his head among monarchs. He seems to have inherited with the throne a legacy of national disorder, similar to that which eventually brought about the ruin of Louis XVI of France. With all the best intentions possible, he was unable to stem the tide. Overtaxation brought in its train, as it always does in China, first resistance and then rebellion. The emperor was besieged in Peking by a rebel army. The treasury was empty. There were too few soldiers to man the walls, and the capital fell. On the previous night, the emperor, who had refused to flee, slew the eldest princess, commanded the empress to commit suicide, and sent his three sons into hiding. At dawn, the bell was struck for the court to assemble, but no one came. His Majesty then ascended the well-known hill in the palace grounds, and wrote a last decree on the lapel of his robe. Poor in virtue, and of contemptible personality, I have incurred the wrath of high heaven. My ministers have deceived me. I am ashamed to meet my ancestors, and therefore I myself take off my cap of state, and with my hair covering my face, await dismemberment at the hands of you rebels." Instead of the usual formula, respect this, the emperor added, spare my people. He then hanged himself, and the great Ming dynasty was no more. Chinese studies have always laboured under this disadvantage, that the ludicrous side of China and her civilization was the one which first attracted the attention of foreigners, and to a great extent it does so still. There was a time when China was regarded as a land of opposites, that is, diametrically opposed to us in every imaginable direction. For instance, in China the left hand is the place of honour. Men keep their hats on in company, use fans, mount their horses on the offside, begin dinner with fruit and end it with soup, shake their own instead of their friends' hands when meeting, begin at what we call the wrong end of a book, and read from right to left, down vertical columns, wear white for mourning, have huge visiting cards instead of small ones, prevent criminals from having their hair cut, regard the south as the standard point of the compass, begin to build a house by putting on the roof first, besides many other nicer distinctions, the mere enumeration of which would occupy much of the time at my disposal. The other side of the medal, showing the similarities and even the identities, has been unduly neglected, and yet it is precisely from a study of these similarities and identities that the best results can be expected. A glance at any good dictionary of classical antiquities 
will at once reveal the minute and painstaking care with which even the small details of life in ancient Greece have been examined into and discussed. The Chinese have done like work for themselves, and many of their beautifully illustrated dictionaries of archaeology would compare not unfavorably with anything we have to show. There are also many details of modern everyday existence in China which may fairly be quoted to show that Chinese civilization is not, after all, that comic condition of topsy-turvydom which the term usually seems to connote. The Chinese house may not be a facsimile of a Greek house, far from it. Still, we may note its position facing south, in order to have as much sun in winter and as little in summer as possible, its division into men's and women's apartments, the fact that the doors are in two leaves and open inward, the rings or handles on the doors, the portable braziers used in the rooms in cold weather, and the shrines of the household gods, all of which characteristics are to be found equally in the Greek house. There are also points of resemblance between the lives led by Chinese and Athenian ladies, beyond the fact that the former occupy a secluded portion of the house. The Chinese do not admit their women to social entertainments, and prefer, as we are told was the case with Athenian husbands, to dine by themselves rather than expose their wives to the gaze of their friends. If the Athenian dame went out at all, it was to see some religious procession, or to a funeral, and if sufficiently advanced in years, she might occasionally visit a female friend and take breakfast with her. And so in China it is religion which breaks the monotony of female life, and collects within the temples, on the various festivals, an array of painted faces and embroidered skirts that present, even to the European eye, a not unpleasing spectacle. That painting the face was universal among the women of Greece, much after the fashion which we now see in China, has been placed beyond all doubt, the pigments used in both cases being white lead and some kind of vegetable red, with lamp black for the eyebrows. In marriage we find the Chinese aiming, like the Greeks, at equality of rank and fortune between the contracting parties, or, as the Chinese put it, in the guise of a household word, at a due correspondence between the doorways of the betrothed couple. As in Greece, so in China, we find the marriage arranged by the parents, the veiled bride, the ceremony of fetching her from her father's house, the equality of man and wife, the toleration of subordinate wives, and many other points of contact. The same sights and scenes which are daily enacted at any of the great Chinese centres of population seem also to have been enacted in the Athenian marketplace, with its simmering kettles of boiled peas and other vegetables, and its chapmen and retailers of all kinds of miscellaneous goods. In both we have the public storyteller, surrounded by a well-packed group of fascinated and eager listeners. The puppet shows, Agalmata Neurospasta, which Herodotus tells us were introduced into Greece from Egypt, are constantly to be seen in Chinese cities, and date from the second century BC, a suggestive period as I shall hope to show later on. The Chinese say that these puppets originated in China, as follows. The first emperor of the Han dynasty was besieged, about 200 BC, in a northern city, by a vast army of Xiongnu, the ancestors of the Huns, under the command of the famous chieftain Mao Dun. One of the Chinese generals, with the besieged emperor, discovered that Mao Dun's wife, who was in command on one side of the city, was an extremely jealous woman, and he forthwith caused a number of wooden puppets, representing beautiful girls, and worked by strings, to be exhibited on the wall overlooking the chieftain's lamp. At this, we are told, the lady's fears for her husband's fidelity were aroused, and she drew off her forces. The above account may be dismissed as a tale, in which case we are left with Punch and Judy on our hands. To return to city sites, 
The tricks of street jugglers, as witnessed in China, seem to be very much those of ancient Greece. In both countries we have such feats as jumping about amongst naked swords, spitting fire from the mouth, and passing a sword down the throat. Then there are the advertisements on the walls, the mule carts and mule litters, the sunshades or umbrellas carried by women in Greece, by both sexes in China. The Japanese language is said to contain no terms of abuse, so refined are the inhabitants of that earthly paradise. The Chinese language more than makes up for this deficiency, and it is certainly curious that, as in ancient Greece, the names of animals are not frequently used in this connection, with the sole exception of the dog. No Chinaman will stand being called a dog, although he really has a great regard for the animal, as a friend whose fidelity is proof even against poverty. In the ivory shops in China will be found many specimens of the carver's craft, which will bear comparison, for the patience and skill required, with the greatest triumphs of Greek workmen. Both nations have reproduced the human hand in ivory. The Greeks used it as an ornament for a hairpin. The Chinese attach it to a slender rod, about a foot and a half in length, and use it as a back-scratcher. The Chinese drama, which we can only trace vaguely to Central Asian sources, and no farther back than the twelfth century of our era, has some points of contact with the Greek drama. In Greece the plays began at sunrise and continued all day, and they do still in the open-air stages of rural districts in China, in both cases performed entirely by men, without interval between the pieces, without curtain, without prompter, and without any attempt at realism. As formerly in Greece, so now in China, the words of the play are partly spoken and partly sung, the voice of the actor being in both countries of the highest importance. Like the Greek actor before masks were invented, the Chinese actor paints his face, and the thick-soled boot which raises the Chinese tragedian from the ground is very much the counterpart of the Cothornus. The arrangement by which the Greek gods appeared in a kind of balcony looking out, as it were, from the heights of Olympus, is well known to the Chinese stage, while the methodical character of Greek tragic dancing, with the chorus moving right and left, is strangely paralleled in the dances performed at the worship of Confucius in the Confucian temples, details of which may be seen in any illustrated Chinese encyclopedia. Games with dice are of a high antiquity in Greece, they date in China only from the 2nd century AD, having been introduced from the West under the name of Shupu, a term which has so far defied identification. The custom of fighting quails was once a political institution in Athens, and under early dynasties it was a favourite amusement at the imperial court of China. The game of guess fingers is another form of amusement common to both countries, so also is the custom of drinking by rule, under the guidance of a toastmaster, with fines of deep draughts of wine to be swallowed by those who fail in capping verses, answering conundrums, recognising quotations, to which may be added the custom of introducing singing girls toward the close of the entertainment. At Athens, too, it was customary to begin a drinking bout with small cups, and resort to larger ones later on a process which must be familiar to all readers of Chinese novels, wherein, toward the close of the revel, the half-drunken hero invariably calls for more capacious goblets. Neither does the ordinary Chinaman approve of a short allowance of wine at his banquets, as witness the following story, translated from a Chinese book of anecdotes. A stingy man, who had invited some guests to dinner, told his servants not to fill up their wine-cups to the brim as is usual. During the meal, one of the guests said to his host, "'These cups of yours are too deep. You should have them cut down.' "'Why so?' inquired the host. "'Well,' replied the guest, "'you don't seem to use the top part for anything.' 
There's another story of a man who went to dine at a house where the wine cups were very small, and who, on taking his seat at table, suddenly burst out into groans and lamentations. "'What is the matter with you?' cried the host in alarm. "'Ah!' replied his guest, "'my feelings overcame me. My poor father, when dining with a friend who had cups like yours, lost his life by accidentally swallowing one. The water clock, or clepsydra, has been known to the Chinese for centuries. Where did it come from? Is it a mere coincidence that the ancient Greeks used water clocks? Is it a mere coincidence that the Greeks used an abacus, or counting board, on which the beads slid up and down in vertical grooves, while on the Chinese counting board the only difference is that the beads slide up and down on vertical rods. Is it a mere coincidence that the olive should be associated in China, as in Greece, with propitiation? To this day, a Chinaman who wishes to make up a quarrel will send a piece of red paper containing an olive, in token of friendly feeling, and the acceptance of this means that the quarrel is at an end. The olive was supposed by the Greeks to have been brought by Hercules from the land of the Hyperboreans. The Chinese say it was introduced into China in the 2nd century BC. The extraordinary similarities between the Chinese and Pythagorean systems of music place it beyond a doubt that one must have been derived from the other. The early Jesuit fathers declared that the ancient Greeks borrowed their music from the Chinese, but we know now that the music in question did not exist in China until two centuries after its appearance in Greece. The music of the Confucian age perished, books and instruments together, at the burning of the books in B.C. 212, and we read that in the first part of the second century B.C., the hereditary music master was altogether ignorant of his art. Where did the new art come from? and how are its Greek characteristics to be accounted for? There are also equally extraordinary similarities between the Chinese and Greek calendars. For instance, in B.C. 104, the Chinese adopted a cycle of nineteen years, a period which was found to bring together the solar and the lunar years. But this is precisely the cycle, Ennea Kaide Kaiteris, said to have been introduced by Meton in the 5th century BC, and adopted at Athens about BC 330. Have we here another coincidence of no particular importance? The above list might be very much extended. Meanwhile, the question arises, are there any records of any kind in China, which might lead us to suppose that the Chinese ever came into contact in any way with the civilization of ancient Greece? We know from Chinese history that, so far back as the 2nd century BC, victorious Chinese generals carried their arms far into Central Asia, and succeeded in annexing such distant regions as Koten, Kokand, and the Pamirs. About BC 138, a statesman named Zhang Qian was sent on a mission to Bactria, and was taken prisoner by the Xiongnu, the forebears of the Huns, and detained in captivity for over ten years. He finally managed to escape, and proceeded to Fergana, and thence on to Bactria, returning home in B.C. 126, after having been once more captured by the Xiongnu, and again detained for about a year. Now Bactria was then a Greek kingdom, which had been founded by Diodotus in B.C. 256, and it would appear to have had, already for some time, commercial relations with China, for Zhang Qian reported that he had seen Chinese merchandise exposed there in the markets for sale. We farther learned that Zhang Qian brought back with him the walnut and the grape, previously unknown in China, and taught his countrymen the art of making wine. The wine of the Confucian period was like the wine of today in China, an ardent spirit distilled from rice. There is no grape wine in China now, although grapes are plentiful and good. But we know from the poetry which has been preserved to us, as well as from the researches of Chinese archaeologists, 
that grape wine was largely used in China for many centuries subsequent to the date of Zhang Qian. In fact, down to the beginning of the 15th century, if not later. One writer says it was brought, together with the heavenly horse, from Persia, when the extreme west was opened up a century or so before the Christian era, as already mentioned. I must now make what may well appear to be an uncalled-for digression, but it will only be a temporary digression, and will bring us back in a few minutes to the grape, the heavenly horse, and to Persia. Mirrors seem to have been known to the Chinese from the earliest ages. One authority places them so far back as 2500 BC. They are at any rate mentioned in the Odes, say 800 BC, and were made of polished copper, being in shape, according to the earliest dictionary, like a large basin. About 100 BC, a new kind of mirror comes into vogue, called by an entirely new name not used before. In common with the word previously employed, its indicator is metal, showing under which kingdom it falls, that is, a mirror of metal. These new mirrors were small discs of melted metal, highly polished on one side and profusely decorated with carvings on the other, a description which exactly tallies with that of the ancient Greek mirror. Specimens survived to comparatively recent times, and it is even alleged that many of these old mirrors are in existence still. A large number of illustrations of them are given in the great encyclopedia of the 18th century, and the fifth of these, in chronological order, 2nd century BC, is remarkable as being ornamented with the well-known key, or Greek pattern, so common in Chinese decoration. Another is covered with birds flying about among branches of pomegranate, laden with fruit cut in halves to show the seeds. Shortly afterwards we come to a mirror so lavishly decorated with bunches of grapes and vine leaves that the eye is arrested at once. Interspersed with these are several animals, among others the lion, which is unknown in China. The Chinese word for lion, as I stated in my first lecture, is shi, an imitation of the Persian shir. There is also a lion's head with a bar in its mouth, recalling the door handles to temples in ancient Greece. Besides the snake, the tortoise, and the sea otter, there is what is far more remarkable than any of these, namely, a horse with wings. On comparing the latter with Pegasus, as he appears in sculpture, it is quite impossible to doubt that the Chinese is a copy of the Greek animal. The former is said to have come down from heaven, and was caught, according to tradition, on the banks of a river in B.C. 120. The name for pomegranate in China is the Parthian fruit, showing that it was introduced from Parthia, the Chinese equivalent for Parthia being Anxi, which is an easy corruption of the Greek Arsakes, the first king of Parthia. The term for grape is admittedly of foreign origin, like the fruit itself. It is Putao, here it is easy to recognize the Greek word botrus, a cluster or bunch of grapes. Similarly, the Chinese word for radish, luobo, also of foreign origin, is no doubt a corruption of rafe, it being of course well known that the Chinese cannot pronounce an initial r. There is one term, especially in Chinese, which at once carries conviction as to its Greek origin. This is the term for watermelon. The two Chinese characters used to represent the sound mean western gourd, that is, the gourd which came from the west. Some Chinese say, or no authority in particular, that it was introduced by the Kitan Tartars. Others say that it was introduced by the first emperor of the so-called Golden Tartars. But the Chinese term is still produced Xi Gua, which is absolutely identical with the Greek word Sikua, of which Liddell and Scott say, perhaps the melon. For these three words it would now scarcely be rash to substitute the watermelon. We are not on quite such firm ground when we compare the Chinese calends and ides with similar divisions of the Roman month. 
Still, it is interesting to note that in ancient China the first day of every month was publicly proclaimed, a sheep being sacrificed on each occasion. Also that the Latin word calendai meant the day when the order of the days was proclaimed. Further, that the term in Chinese for Ides means to look at, to see, because on that day we can see the moon, and also that the Latin word idus, the etymology of which has not been absolutely established, may possibly come from the Greek idain, to see, just as kalendai comes from kalain, to proclaim. As to the many analogies, more or less interesting, to be found in the literatures of China and of Western nations, it is not difficult to say how they got into their Chinese setting. For instance, we read in the history of the Ming dynasty, A.D. 1368-1644, to a full account of the method by which the Spaniards, in the 16th century, managed to obtain first a footing in, and then the sovereignty over, some islands, which have now passed under the American flag. The following words, not quite without interest at the present day, are translated from the above-mentioned account of the Philippines. The Fulankis, that is the Franks, who at that time had succeeded by violence in establishing trade relations with Luzon, the old name of the Philippines, saw that the nation was weak and might easily be conquered, Accordingly they sent rich presents to the king of the country, begging him to grant them a piece of land as big as a bull's hide, for building houses to live in. The king, not suspecting guile, conceded their request, whereupon the Fulangis cut the hide into strips and joined them together, making many hundreds of ten-foot measures in length, and then, having surrounded with these a piece of ground, called upon the king to stand by his promise. The king was much alarmed, but his word had been pledged, and there was no alternative but to submit. So he allowed them to have the ground, charging a small ground rent, as was the custom. But no sooner had the Falanges got the ground than they put up houses and ramparts and arranged their fire weapons, cannon, and engines of attack. Then, seizing their opportunity, they killed the king, drove out the people, and took possession of the country. It is scarcely credible that Chinese historians would have recorded such an incident, unless some trick of the kind had actually been carried out by the Spaniards, in imitation of the famous classical story of the foundation of Carthage. A professional writer of marvellous tales who flourished in the seventeenth century tells a similar story of the early Dutch settlers. Formerly, when the Dutch were permitted to trade with China, the officer in command of the coast defences would not allow them, on account of their great numbers, to come ashore. The Dutch begged very hard for the grant of a piece of land, such as a carpet would cover, and the officer above mentioned thinking that this could not be very large, acceded to their request. A carpet was accordingly laid down, big enough for about two people to stand on, but by dint of stretching it was soon able to accommodate four or five, and so the foreigners went on, stretching and stretching, until at last it covered about an acre, and by and by, with the help of their knives, they had filched a piece of ground several miles in extent. These two stories must have sprung from one and the same source. It is not, however, always so simple a matter to see how other Western incidents found their way into Chinese literature. For instance, there is a popular anecdote to be found in a Chinese jest book, which is almost word for word with another anecdote in Greek literature. A soldier, who was escorting a Buddhist priest, charged with some crime, to a prison at a distance, being very anxious not to forget anything, kept saying over and over the four things he had to think about, himself, his bundle, his umbrella, and the priest. At night he got drunk, and the Buddhist priest, after first shaving the soldier's head, ran away. When the soldier awakened, he began his formula, myself, bundle, umbrella. Oh dear, he cried, putting his hands to his head, the priest has gone. Stop a moment, he added, finding his hands in contact with a bald head. 
Here's the priest. It is I who have run away. As found in Greek literature, the story, attributed to Heracles, but probably much later, says that the prisoner was a bald-headed man, a condition which is suggested to the Chinese reader by the introduction of a Buddhist priest. Whether the Chinese got this story from the Greeks, or the Greeks got it from the Chinese, I do not pretend to know. The fact is that we students of Chinese at the present day know very little beyond the vague outlines of what there is to be known. Students of Greek have long since divided up their subject under such heads as pure scholarship, history, philosophy, archaeology, and then again have made subdivisions of these. In the Chinese field nothing of the kind has yet been done. The consequence is that the labourers in that field, compelled to work over a large superficies, are only able to turn out more or less superficial work. The cry is for more students, practical students of the written and colloquial languages, for the purposes of diplomatic intercourse and the development of commerce, and also students of the history, philosophy, archaeology and religions of China, men whose contributions to our present stock of knowledge may throw light upon the many important points which, for lack of workmen, have hitherto remained neglected and unexplored. End of Lecture 4